guys are ridiculous. These guys are ridiculous. Now, how about them damn Celtics? And we are back with another episode of How About Them Celtics. Sam and I are here recording on Wednesday, December 13th, uh, day after the Celtics took down the Cavaliers in their first of two back-to-back games at home. Uh, also, the day of the Celtics signing uh, Drew Peterson to a two-way contract, which we will get into, but we also did post a video on the channel if you'd like to see our immediate reaction to the move. Um, but before we get into anything, per usual, let's do some in-pop Nito uh, giveaway. Uh, a lot of entries into the Incognito sweepstake sweepstakes. Oh yes, excuse me today. People know uh, <laughs> it's fire. Simply, Sam, simply put, fire. Mm-hmm. Well, I get the wheel set up because I forgot to put the names in. Sam, why don't you tell the people about some of your favorite flavors? Help me out here, filibuster for a second. All right, yeah, Incognito. They've got all kinds of flavors. They have sweet, salty, uh, buttery, spicy. You name it. Some of my favorite cinnamon toast. Uh, the caramel apple one was good. Perfect Storm is excellent. I love the cheesy garlic bread. Dill pickle was a banger. Uh, strawberries and cream. I could go on and on and on if my nose was not blocked. But <laughs> if you do win, you'll have $10 to use on the website, like a gift card. And mm-hmm. that means you'll be able to pretty much get a free bag. It's awesome. And it's a large bag. I mean, this is about $10 in value. I've had this for a while, and it's still kicking. Perfect. Perfect timing. My favorite for what it's worth. I like the Cheddar Disguise Caramel. I think it's great. That's one of my favorites. A lot of entries today. A lot of entries, which means your chance to win is the minute. How many did we have enter? 11. 11 today. 11. Leave. This is the username. I believe this is Justin. I believe this this is Justin from the YouTube comments. So... Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. I'm gonna go go check here uh, to make sure that I haven't forgotten anybody, uh, or, or that I have the, the username correct. I love when yeah. I see a full wheel. <clears throat> mm-hmm. This is Justin Ooh. Mills. Shout out Justin, legend of the chat, legend of the comments. You're gonna be getting some popcorn. Uh, make sure to shoot us an email at hptcpod at gmail.com if you're hearing or listening to this. I'll respond to a comment. We'll get you hooked up in the next few days uh, with some popcorn and a gift card to Pop Nito. So thank you for entering. Uh, you can't get it off. Jesus Christ. Uh, As we go uh, to the first thing, I mentioned it at the very start of the podcast. Uh, Celtics have signed uh, Drew Peterson to a two-way contract. Now, Sam was at basketball when the news dropped, so I covered the news for the channel myself. Go check out the video. Uh, I looked at some of the highlights. We're not going to look at full highlight real tape here. Uh, However, uh, I figured I'd give my thoughts. Phil Sam in. Sam, have you seen anything uh, on Twitter like of what he does, et cetera, et cetera? Well... I mean, you just take one look at him. You know what he does. But I do know who this is. By name, I did not know who it is. But when I saw him, I did recognize him. He played well for the Heat in the Summer League. Um, He is a sharp, shooting, six foot nine fella. He was wearing, like, number 70 or something wild when he was mm. playing in the Summer League, too. That's why I remember him. But what I will say is if Miami is giving up on a guy, and they get the every last well, drop out of every did not, single guy. They did not give up on him. The Celtics poached him. He was. Yeah, they, they didn't have an. Op- they also poached this- Sam Hauser for 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 what it's worth. Okay. Sam Hauser right. was also right. in the Heat and, and then decided to sign with the Celtics instead. So like th- this is the Celtics have had a back and forth with the Heat's G League system. Justin Champagne as well. Like there is something there. Um, I don't know how much Champagne there is. Did really there. pan out. He's actually played. They're really bad five hundred. He's actually playing really well in the G League this summer. Back yeah, who with cares? The so, um, well, just uh, excuse me, Drew Peterson, twenty-four years old, six foot nine, uh, big guy, averaging fifteen point two points, five and a half rebounds, four point two assists uh, in the G League uh, in I think twelve or thirteen games for the Heat so far this season. Fifty-three uh, percent from the field, almost forty-one percent from three, under around four and a half attempts a night. Um, biggest thing to note: great passer for his size. I said this on the video when I was reacting to it. You don't really see guys of that height and stature um, be good passers unless they are like the Jason Datums and Paul Georges of the world. Like the only guys who are six foot nine can shoot and pass are usually superstars. So it's kind of rare for a role player to be as good of a passer as comfortable passing the ball as Drew Peterson is comfortable with the ball in his hands as well. Can create his own shot a little bit works out of the post from what I saw in, in U- at USC or is at least comfortable with it. Um, good three point shooter. His shot form is a little 
odd. He has got like a little, <coughs> excuse me, a little hitch. It's not as fluid as Sam Hauser. He kind of like stops up here yeah. and then shoots, but it works for him. Goes in at a 41% clips. Um, he's spoken about his defense before. This was an interview. I think it was posted by Sports Illustrated. I think the biggest thing for me is that I can do whatever a team needs. I'm here to fill any role, whether it's shooting, passing, or rebounding, defending. I'm your guy, ready to be plugged in wherever. Where the league is headed with positionless basketball, I think I'm perfectly suited for that. I know the no ceiling guys uh, who we are friends with did a film session last year with Drew Peterson reviewing some of his own film. Um, again, on the Heat's G League team, spent five years in college, first couple with Rice, then three years at USC, blossomed in his junior and er, two senior seasons technically because he had that extra COVID uh, year in college. So I, I like him. I think he's a good developmental piece. And the point I made uh, when we were talking with Bobby earlier, which just so happened to be right before uh, this news dropped, this seems right. like a guy who the Celtics could bring up the pipeline because Sam Hauser is going to need an extension. I'm not saying they should let Sam Hauser go, but it's always good to develop more Sam Hauser type players. And this is what this seems like. Yeah. I mean, listen, you can't really go wrong by adding shooting. It's something you're always going to need, especially because he has size. He does sound like he's some guy that they can plug and play, maybe not right away, but somewhere down the line, he can certainly earn minutes and not be a massive mismatch every time he's switched on defense. Hopefully he's able to move his feet fast enough to stay in front of guys. He definitely did not look like the strongest individual, but he is so scrawny from what I watched. He is a he's a twig, like like unbelievably skinny from what I saw on the film. Like it's crazy. I mean, this, this is a lot of pot kettle for me, but uh, buddy, <laughs> you, you turn sideways, you can't see him. He is very skinny. That's he good is, though on defense. Uh, I mean, on offense, you just have him turn sideways, and then they'll be like, "Oh wait, there's a guy there," and then he's open. It's true. <laughs> That's how he shoots forty one percent. They just they don't see him. Mm. Uh, but yeah, go go check out the video where I looked at some of his highlights. Drew Peterson, good player, uh, good developmental piece. And from the way this all worked out, it seems like the Celtics had their eye on him because they cut somebody to bring him in, which like good sign. Celtics have been good at developing solid players. Excuse me, over the past few seasons, Sam House, Luke Cornett both came up through the G League. Looks like they have something in Demiash Kata for what we've seen on the glass. Um, they're good at identifying talent and, and building a farm system is something I've written about for Celtics blog. Uh, and I, I think it's important moving forward, especially with the new CBA. So <clears throat> happy with Drew Peterson. It's a good point. I mean, they, they have to find players without spending a ton of money down the line. Cause you're going to have the Jalen extension. Tatum's going to have an extension. That's about the same, if not more. Uh, Porzingis is under contract 30 million for the next two seasons. After this one, Drew holiday is probably going to re up. Then you have to pay Derek white. You know, Horford makes ten million a year, and it goes on and on and on. You're gonna have to pay Hauser eventually if you want to keep him. There is so much money going around that you have to find guys that are essentially free guys. You need to do what the Heat do. You need to find all the free guys. So mm -hmm. good for them. I think Brad Stevens has done a really good job at at least trying to do this in, in working towards bringing in the right guys to take up the G League spots. Not only the two ways, but find the right guys to play up in Maine, make sure that they've got good personnel around the guys they're trying to develop. Good for them. Fan of it. I agree. It feels like Brad Stevens is putting more of an emphasis on finding uh, a role player farm system up in Maine, which is, again, something I wrote about before the season. But next thing we got is something from Brian Windhorst of BCPN. Uh, and it's only interesting because of what came out from Shams yes. a couple weeks ago. This, this would usually be a, duh, no shit, windy moment. But it does seem like more of conflicting reporting uh, shams a couple weeks ago for context reported that the Celtics would be active on the trade market. They plan on getting active, which didn't really make sense because they didn't really have the pieces to do that. Uh, it was kind of weird, but Brian Windhorst of ESPN reported uh, that the Celtics and the Bucks for what it's worth, unlikely to make significant trades, but expected to be active on the buyout market quote Celtics have six premium starters and it makes them one of the most, uh, one of the best NBA teams. But after that coach Joe Mazzulla has less experience slash proven players on his bench, getting one more quality, excuse me, quality rotation player at any position would give Boston options. Uh, again, duh, that they would be active on the on the um, buyout market rather than the trade market. But the fact that Shams reported, oh, yeah, they're going to make trades. And then Wendy's like, all right, calm, calm the fuck down. Um, this is kind of what I assumed. I think it's kind of what you assumed as well. We can briefly touch on buyout guys, but like, why? No, no, yeah, it's too yeah, soon. But, but my question is, why would Shams report the trade thing? Was he just speculating versus Wendy saying this? Like, is this just both of them speculating and Wendy speculating with what we agree with? Or do you think they both have reporting from somewhere that they're throwing out there? Uh, 
this is what I think. I think Wendy is right. I think Wendy is speculating, but I think his take makes the most sense, right? The Celtics don't have tradable assets. They don't have salary filler. They really can't get anybody that's going to move the needle for them. And I think that might be what he's pointing out. Like Shams might be saying they're going to make a small trade because Shams wasn't like they're going to make a splash. He just said they're going to be a little bit active looking to round out the roster, which could be true. Maybe they see somebody they like that's on a minimum. Wendy's saying, listen, they're not getting anybody exciting. You're not going to see the Woj tweet and be like, oh, they got him? Free guy? No. When you see the Woj tweet and you're excited, it's going to be the buyout market. The problem is, it's December 13th as we're recording this. There really aren't a ton of teams that you're like, huh, wonder if they'll buy, buy out that guy or that guy or that guy. There's either really, really bad teams, Pistons, Spurs, Wizards, or just about everybody else is in the mix. Even Chicago, we we clown on them a lot, but like the Levine situation clearly is putting a strain on the team. He is not somebody that's a winning player. It's proven time and time again. And now that he is injured, a.k.a. sitting out because they're trying to trade him, but nobody actually wants him. The team's actually playing well. Wow. Can you believe that? Shocking stuff. Addition by subtraction. So, like, even if you want to look at Chicago, like, who's getting bought out? You really can't be like, him or him. Not yet. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to get more buyout stuff in about a month. You're going to be like, oh, how about this guy? Eyeballs. Be sick of the sellers got him. Yeah, I think you got to look at some of those bad teams like the Pistons, Alec Burks, Joe Harris, Monte Morris. But again, how useful would any of those guys be? Uh, PJ Tucker is a name that's intriguingly came up as of late because he's not really playing for the Clippers. Don't know how interested the Celtics would be. I don't really see the value in that. It feels like he wouldn't really play a ton for the Celtics, especially considering his three-point shot's been on the decline. Um, <clears throat> DeLon Wright has been injured. Maybe he gets bought out by the Wizards, but it seems more likely they find a trade partner. Thad Young, if the Raptors blow it up, but again, that might be more of a, you know, get a veteran to be a presence on the bench rather than actually give minutes. And at that point, are the Celtics really going to spend the money? Um, I don't know. Like you said, it feels like we'll get some more buyout stuff coming out uh, in a month or so. For now, agree with Wendy's potentially speculation, potentially reporting that the Celtics aren't going to be very active on the trade market. It just never seemed likely with the assets they have, unless they make a small trade into the TPE. But even then, like, well, that's what are you going to get? Yeah. But, well, no, they can still use the TPE, but. Oh, okay. Um, yes, it's just... Well, you, you yeah. do have to respect Wendy. He really is sticking his neck out. <laughs> he's, he's going out on a limb here with this reporting. Yeah. Uh, but, all right. Next thing we got is Drew Holiday talking about his recent matchup with Giannis Antetokounmpo. Obviously, the Celtics took on the Bucks a couple weeks ago at this point, but Drew was the primary defender on Giannis uh, for most of that game. He was on the view, Views from the Raptors podcast. Great name. Sick name. Um, where'd you, where'd uh, you he, get and it? He, and he talked about it. He said, um, basically, he was asked, like, did you ask for that matchup? Was it something Joe just gave to you? And he said, I don't remember. But I think when they told me, I was like, fucking right. <laughs> I was like, right, as I should be. It's not like, uh, but it's not like it's the first time I guarded Giannis. But kind of at that level, you know, that's my man. It just makes it more fun because I know he's going to compete against me in the same way. Basically saying, like, yeah, we're cool. We're friends. But, like, I want to beat him. And, and, and I'm the competitive dude. And when they said I was on Giannis, I was like, as I damn well should be, which fire to hear that from Drew Holiday going to get up against Giannis. Uh, I just, I just like hearing guys being competitive like that. I thought it was uh, a fun quote to listen to. Yeah. I mean, this is exactly what you traded for. This is why you went out and you got rid of Rob. You got rid of Brogdon, got rid of some picks because you wanted somebody that has that dog mentality. You gave up smart in the Porzingis trade. And there was really no indication that you had that within the team and holiday is not somebody that comes off as a fiery pump up dog to have on your team, but he definitely likes to compete as a Celtics supporter. Having watched the team for years, having watched them play the box in the playoffs, you've been on the wrong end of it. Like, you know, he had a game three where he killed the Celtics and he, he was unbelievable. He won Milwaukee a game. He can do that for the Celtics. Why won't he? He's going to have a chip on his shoulder, whether he wants to admit it or not, when he plays Milwaukee. He clearly cared the first time they played because he couldn't buy a basket. He was so tense and pressing. But, of course, 
Yeah. I mean, Giannis is a likable guy. He doesn't seem like a prick. Thanasis, maybe, but not Giannis. And, you know, of course Drew Holiday's going to want to compete against his buddy. That's how you get when you play against anybody that you're tight with. You want to beat him. Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action NFL. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including you got spreads, you got your player props, you got over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash Boston and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. I agree. Uh, I agree. And and for what it's worth, we talked about it a lot early in the season. It feels like we haven't talked about it a lot lately. Drew Holiday is still one of the most versatile pieces defensively in the league, and he showed that. His ability to guard bigs, his ability to scramble on the perimeter, like a lot of the conversation defensively, uh, especially after the Cavs game, was Chris Stops and what he can do because he's awesome. But like Drew Holiday is still a defensive player of the year candidate, and he's played like that this season. Like he has truly taken on – Every single role Joe was, <coughs> excuse me, Joe Mazzula and the Celtics have asked him to take on this year. He's guarding guards. He's guarding Embiid. He's guarding Giannis. He's guarding everybody in between. And Randall. On, uh, Randall, sure. Uh, on top of that, he's also taking on the role of guarding a, you know, maybe not a star so he can play free safety and run around. Like, he's doing everything. That's a new thing, uh, which is very exciting. impressive. It's great. It's super fun to see. Mini Rob. Half the number. Similar hair, mm-hmm. headband, absolute dog. Love it. I, I like the Romer. It was something we saw when Rob was here. He was excellent at it because he could block shots. It's a little different watching somebody play free safety looking for interceptions, steals, almost like a football player, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I love Holiday. I, I think he has been very impressive in the way that he's accepted what the Celtics have given to him. He's taking far less shots than he took with the Bucs. He has his hands on the ball a lot less. Yet, for the most part, he's still been very effective. He's been reliable when he's open and knocks down shots, which is really all they ask of him. And I think Mm -hmm. in the long run, as I struggle here, I'm sorry. In the long run, it's going to be helpful when he's aging because he Mm -hmm. has a lot less stress on his body on the offensive end, and he really only has to exert himself defensively. It doesn't mean that he can't pop off for a big game scoring-wise, but he's really only being asked to play hard on one end of the floor. Yeah. I mean, uh, for audio listeners, I just pulled up some clips of Drew Holiday guarding Giannis uh, in the Celtics-Bucks game. Like His mentality of... Or, or I should say willingness, and these are makes and misses, so I, you get the full picture. But his willingness to take on every matchup, I think, is the most impressive thing. And and obviously, that's like that's the bar in the NBA. You got to try, right? Like as silly as that sounds, that truly is the bar. And some players, it, it is a lot to ask um, at times, though. But you know, Drew Holiday's. You always call what do you call Derek White the shapeshifter? Like like shape-shifter. his yeah. yeah. So Drew Holiday's willingness to take on any matchup. And not only willingness, but like he wants to take it on. Like they asked him, like, you know, what'd you think of the Giannis matchup? And he was like, damn right. Like, I better be on Giannis. Like, he wants to guard the opposing team's best player. And oftentimes he is the one to guard the opposing team's best player. The only time when he doesn't is is usually when it's a smaller guard and then Derek White takes it on because the Celtics have the luxury of having five <laughs> defensive monsters on the floor at all time. Like, this truly has to be a defensive mastermind's dream this team like drew holiday all defensive guard Derek white all defensive guard christoph's Porzingis, one of the better rim protectors in the league as we're seeing now jason tatum one of the most underrated defenders in the league because he does fucking everything and then jalen brown is a giant body who can guard three or, or guards and forwards like everybody and then i didn't even talk about fucking al horford like and then there's al horford too like this whole defensive lineup uh is awesome and drew holiday feels like almost the engine that has kept it running this year, but it's a different way than Marcus Smart. Cause that's what we always said with Marcus, that he's the engine. Drew Holiday doesn't necessarily do it with those fiery big plays. He just does it by doing everything quietly. consistently quiet, yeah. which is, is 
that, that's not a shot or, or you know saying one way or the other is correct it's just like it's a different way but it's the same effect in my opinion yeah i think the play of holiday his quiet contribution is more likely to make for a more consistent team because you can rely on that every single night not to say marcus didn't give you everything he had every I was gonna single say, game shit talking no <laughs> But the fact that he's so good and you don't even have to notice it is a is a big like wow. Oh wow, they really made out. They got this guy and mm-hmm. he's gonna add so much. He doesn't need all the shine, he doesn't need the ball, he's just willing to take on the responsibility that's given to him. And he wants the challenge of playing defense, which you can't say for every star player in the NBA at all. A lot of these guys hate it. I think the Celtics have a good crew of guys that really, really want to compete and be the best on both ends. Uh, Tatum and Brown both came out and said they want to be defensive, all, all defensive team guys. Porzingis is somebody we talked about with Bobby today. Like, oh, he he should be an all-defensive player. He affects shots in the paint, and guys really have to work. And then, of course, Derek White and Drew Holiday, the stock exchange, putting in work. I, I know what you're laughing at. I already laughed at it. Uh, putting in work. And putting opposing guards in the torture chamber. Mm. I mean, look look how well they shut down Cleveland on Tuesday night. Garland, Mitchell, yeah. two of the best scoring uh, guards as a duo. And in the fourth quarter, they gave him nothing. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Drew is awesome. I'm excited uh, for him the rest of the season. And I really think this us praising him for this is going to go from here to here for those audio platforms. It's low level to high level uh, in the playoffs. I like, I think that's really when it's going to be super valuable. Um, do we want, we were saving the NBA thing or do you want to jump yeah, in here and do it. NBA? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Next thing we got in Celtics land is a quick main Celtics G league check-in figured they're about 12 games into the season. We can go in, look at some of the stats, see how players are doing. We can watch some film too. We'll probably get clapped for monetization, but the video will still go up. So it's okay. We'll take the hit. So you guys don't have to see the screen. Um, let's take a look at the, the player stats page. Uh, so J.D. Davison, excuse me, leading the way in scoring as three point shooting actually is taking a little bit of a leap. Thirty four and a half percent. Still not great, but it's not bad for the low volume. and It's better than last year. Uh, Twenty four points, almost nine assists, five rebounds, uh, four turnovers. It's not great. Don't love to see that, but he is playing a lot of minutes. Uh, DJ Stewart also. 29 minutes, 19 points, six rebounds, six assists, three and a half turnovers, uh, 47.5% from the field, 34% from deep. Jordan Walsh up there playing all right, struggling a little bit with the shot, 15 points uh, around around 33% of the field, 30% from three. Want to see that improve steadily. Six rebounds, two and a half assists, one and a half steals. Uh, Jordan Shakel, who was somebody I wrote about for a potential two-way signing, although it went to Drew Peterson. Um, <clears throat> he is fourth on the team in minutes, also fourth in scoring at 13 and a half. 45 from the field, 43 from distance on seven attempts a game. Five rebounds, one and a half assists. Um, he's been solid. Keita is averaging uh, 11 points and five rebounds, but he's only played in three games and only getting 17 minutes, so he hasn't really played a ton up there. Um, <clears throat> Nathan Knight, obviously not on the team anymore, but he played 20. He was playing 23 minutes a night. Tony Snell is up in Maine, for those of you who didn't know, so might, we, we can go see Tony Snell balling out. He's shooting pretty well from three, uh, and no one else is really of note. Everyone else is playing uh, very few minutes. Brandon Slater is the only guy getting significant minutes past that. He's playing around 24 minutes a night, shooting 44%, 33%. Uh, three rebounds um, past that. Nobody else really of note except James Banks is averaging one block a game in 10 minutes a game. So he is uh, make sh- making sure to put in work there. But anything stand out here, Sam? It's a lot of the guys that we know about. Uh, well, and then Jordan Shaquille. I think the Jordan Walsh splits are, I mean, they, it is what it is, but you would like to see him be a bit more efficient. Uh, the summer league was really an encouraging look at him mm-hmm. going into it. These splits are about what we had from Jordan Walsh as we went to the draft, looking at his college numbers. But seeing him play well in the summer league was really encouraging. And a lot of people had high expectations for him coming into the season. They were like, this guy's going to be the new smart. He's going to have all kinds of opportunities with the Celtics. He's going to have minutes. He's going to be the backup wing. Why are people talking about Hauser? Why do people care about Brissett? All the signings they made. Why'd they sign all these guys? They have Jordan Walsh. And... A lot of people like were like, yeah, he's going to come in right out of the draft. That's why they mm-hmm. picked him. That's why they traded back. They were going to take him the whole time, 
which could be true, but I think it says like he's not ready for the NBA yet. Because if he's on hmm. on the the floor with the Celtics, he's going to be left alone on offense. You're playing four on five. Mm-hmm. That's not a guy that's really creating a whole lot for himself. We've seen him do it, but at an NBA level, that's just not going to be his job. And I think that's going to affect him a lot. Can you really just throw him in the corner and expect him to make shots? I don't think so. Even mm-hmm. if he's open, it's going to be a lot of daring. He's going to have to take too many shots. So I'm not ready yet, but he does hustle. He's physical, as you just saw on the screen. It's good to see that he's getting a lot of run at the very least. And he's still relatively young. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't seem like he's ready. He's got the wiry frame still. You want to see him put a little bit of bulk on there. He's a good defender. Obviously, that's why they picked him. He 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 can do things uh, on both ends of the floor, but he, he probably best for him to get this time in Maine, and that was kind of the expectation, uh, at least by the team heading into the season, even though the fan base got some some juice um, <clears throat> from Summer League. Great Jordan dick. Chiquel, Grady Dick just made it through. Jordan Chiquel is still my guy, uh, only because I have a vested inference because I randomly wrote about him two years ago before he was ever on the radar um, as he dunks the ball. He's a shooter. He he is he is consistently one of the best three-point shooters in the G League. Um, defensively, <laughs> yikes, but uh, you can work on that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's the check-in, really. That's all there is so far. Taylor Funk just made a deep three. Uh, we'll keep an, <laughs> excuse me, an eye on this throughout the season. Let y'all know how they progressed. They, they let him wear retired numbers in Maine. Does it? Yeah. Eh, eh, it's not the same jersey. It's whatever. Uh, all right. I'll take the highlights off the screen. Uh, all right. Let's go over to the email. Check in with that. See what we get. The emails. About. I'll get the uh, back. I think we have a lot of emails today. We do. We have a fuck ton of emails. Not surprisingly, but a lot of emails to go over today. A lot of stuff. Uh, I'm just going to clear out quickly the ones with what's popping so I don't give away any information um all right yeah so just making sure i don't i don't dox anybody on the uh <clears throat> on the podcast uh, all right here we go uh this is from a day ago from philip <laughs> hey guys as it's celtics offense hey guys as always i have to say thanks for the great contact content my work stays would be a lot more boring without your pot we appreciate you hey. Happy Glad birthday like is eternal. Uh, happy, happy I like birthday. This... <laughs> we see you. Uh, I like this new rhythm of the IST quote break occurring around the 20 game mark. Feels like the right time to look at n- uh, numbers and see if there's anything to learn. That said, as someone who works in stats, I believe uh, I firmly believe the mark. Mark Twain, who said, quote, there are three types of lies, lies, damned lies and statistics. Pro tip. Don't yeah. tell, tell your clients that expression. I curated a few stats that I would love to hear your thoughts on. Are they insightful or misleading? Um, do they say something good or bad? Lastly, does it inform any of Joe Brad or Joe's midseason adjustments? All right, we're gonna well not rapid fire, but I don't. We don't have to go too in depth. We'll just say informative or misleading, and then we can give a brief like once. Okay. Minute. We are surprisingly fourth in rebound percentage, yet nineteenth in offensive rebound percentage. I'm gonna go with misleading because I think the Celtics have actually been better on the offensive glass this year i think them putting in more effort and i think you see that with the corner crashing every game uh and i and i think the the rebounding percentage is high because the defense is good um and they force misses right they're objectively a good defense um but i i think they're a better offensive rebounding team than that stat show so i'll go a little bit misleading i'll also go misleading uh the reason why they're so low in offensive rebounding is because their offense is so good also they don't really true. need to grab a whole lot of misses when there are less misses. Now, to your first point, statistics, part of the lies. So if you look it up and you're like, wow, the Celtics actually don't shoot that high of a percentage from the field, they should be able to get more offensive rebounds than they do. Uh, it's lying to you. It's fake stat. So pay no attention to it. I don't have the stats in front of me. But knowing what I know, I think they're in the top 10 for offense. I know the defense is towards the top. That's why. That's why the offensive rebounding so low. It's great that they're hitting the defensive glass so much. And I'll say that's not misleading because I feel like there have been a lot less times this year where I was like, damn, it'll be sick as if they actually closed out a defensive possession. I feel like they've done an actually pretty good job at that. So got to give them credit. Uh, next stat, we are 24th in assist percentage and 25th in assist ratio. Um. I think it's a mix. I think the Celtics have gone through stretches this season where they haven't been the best passing team and they've gone to hero ball too much. But I think a lot of that could be that they are learning to to play together with all the stars. And on top of that, like as much as you might not want to hear it, like 
a lot of the times ball movement doesn't directly lead to an assist, right? Like it, it could just lead to a player getting a positive matchup, which leads to a post up, which leads to Jason Tatum getting Emmanuel quickly, whoever in the post and getting a isolation basket, which is a product of good offense, but not necessarily an assist. So I'll say insightful in the sense that there have been times where they should be better at passing the ball, but misleading in the sense that I don't think their offense has been as a whole terrible, especially when everyone's healthy. Sure. Yeah. I, I think it is a learning curve. I don't think they're going to be having the ball popping around, especially in the first five or six games, as much as they're going to have as the season rolls on, as the playoffs come around. I think the ball movement for the most part has been pretty decent. I test. I feel like we've seen a lot less of Tatum dribble, dribble, shoot, which is pretty good. Guys like Derek White are popping off, having big games, making a huge impact. This is back-to-back -back good Derek White games as we're recording this. So I'd say it's a little misleading, but also fair. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Celtics are second in net rating, but 22nd in pace, and our bench is ninth in pace. Uh, I think this is insightful. I think it's because the Celtics are a good half-court offense because they have so much talent that they benefit from slowing it down a little bit. As much as they are a great team in transition, I think a lot of that comes with Sam Hauser can run and get to the three-point line and hit a threes. Peyton Pritchard pushes the pace, right? Um, meanwhile, if you're the Celtics and you have the five better players on the floor, sometimes you want to just break it down and hit the matchups and, and play mismatch hunt, which they've done a lot effectively this season. So... I think it's insightful, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's like facts on the nose, insightful, whatever you want to call it. Celtics offense is a hoss. We already talked about that. The reason the pace is so low is because the offense is such a hoss. You are seeing the Celtics innovate their style of play, though they still take a bunch of threes. They play out of the post a lot more, which is why you slow the game down. Like Jack said, you want to pick on the mismatches. And to your point, Pritchard and Hauser just in there running around and shoot threes. So is Horford, kind of. He's just doing less running around, but he's still shooting yeah, threes. Yeah, I was going to say. Lo loves <laughs> the transition, the but he, he's not uh, he's not posting up as much anymore. Tatum, Porzingis, even Jalen posting up is a good reason to slow down your offense. And mm -hmm. it's working. <laughs> Makes the defense collapse. They have to make a decision. Allows for other guys to knock down threes. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. <clears throat> Last thing. Uh, I'm going to combine these last two because it's defensive ratings and offensive ratings quarter by quarter. First quarter, Celtics have the best defensive and offensive rating. Second quarter, they have the 19th uh, defensive rating and the best offensive rating. Third quarter, they have the third defensive rating and the 29th offensive rating. And in the fourth, they have the 16th best defensive rating and the 13th best offensive rating. I think this tracks... I think outside of last night, ironically enough, against the Cavaliers, they've been very, very, very good in the first quarter about jumping teams. Uh, and then it slowly slows down through the next two quarters. Um, but it does make sense because I, I feel like in the third quarter, they do give up a lot of points. Um, or excuse me, they do clamp down, but they can't score. And in the second quarter, it does sort of feel like uh, they score fine, but they let the other team get back in it slowly. Uh, and then the fourth quarter, I, I think they've actually, I'll, I'll say that's the only one that's a bit misleading because they've been pretty good in clutch games this year. I think they've done a good job of, of finishing things out. They might not be the best uh, in the world in the fourth quarter, but I, I think they've done a better job this year than last year of, for the most part, clamping down and finishing what they've started. Um, but but I, I think these stats match the eye test. Yeah. I'll tell you what is they suck at putting the ball in the basket in the third quarter. It's, a track. it's nice to see in the last couple of games they've been a little bit better at it. Next Didn't game feel was that was happening too much against the Cavs. The next game they built a lead. Um, so maybe they learned after squandering a seven point halftime lead to the Pacers in a meaningful game. But glad to see them have a positive rating in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. It's important. They need to win Agreed. close games. If the Celtics are going to go deep in the playoffs, they have to win the close ones. You can't just rely on beating the shit out of a team every night because it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, Agreed. Glad they're getting out to good starts. Reflects that. I just wish they would hold the lead. Point differential every night. Do it. <laughs> Philip finished with said, I'm surprised about the assistant pace numbers considering how the preseason went. I'm also surprised to see our defense is good in the third. It seems like overall issues are offensive consistency. Looking forward to hear your thoughts. Well, thank you, Philip, for sending in the email. We appreciate you and happy birthday. Next one from Ted Grifkin. Uh, this is again a day ago on air travel security. Hi, guys. Big fan of the show and a frequent, frequent YouTube viewer. Thank you, Ted. We appreciate Thanks. you. 
I heard your comments about security only checking your driver's license rather than your boarding pass. As a frequent traveler, I've also felt the same. So I've asked several times just to see if I'd get different answers. Apparently, your driver's license is connected to your boarding pass. Keep up the great work. Oh, interesting. Uh, P.S. I live in San Diego and frequently go to Vegas. The, ho the hotels actually tried back in the early 90s to go smokeless, and it was a big failure. Gamblers apparently love to smoke. I agree with your relentless comments. Ted Gree. Shout out to you. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Ted. <laughs> Thank you for the insight. Uh, shout out to the guy that got mad at us. The comments. <laughs> that was so funny. Of all the things to get mad for, you're going to get mad at us for condemning smoke. Sorry. Oh, my bad. <laughs> That's on me. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Next email from RJ. What's popping? A winning slog. Evening, guys. Tonight's game was fun to watch. This was after the Cavs game. Not, quote, highlight real fun, but, quote, winning bath winning ball fun. Remember last year how the Celtics would be ahead in the game and you wouldn't feel confident about the lead? Tonight was the reverse. Even when they were down by 15 in the first quarter, you could see the things Cleveland was exploiting and they were all fixable from the freaky zone to the seas not fighting over high screens. Boston knew what to do to get back in control. <clears throat> what was even better was that the Celtics never tried to get the lead back in one fell swoop. They just stayed focused and ran the race through the finish line. I'm looking forward to Thursday's game. Be well, RJ. I actually I asked agree. Derek White about that after the game. I said, you know, how do you fight the mentality of not trying to get it all back in one play. And he said, that's just something we've been trying to do. We just committed to playing the right way and the shots will fall eventually. And it's exactly what they did, which was impressive to see them implement. Cause it's something we talk about a lot. Yeah. When the Celtics were losing, it didn't feel like they were rushing. It didn't feel like a lot of the shots were bad. It felt like a lot of shots were just hitting the back rim. It felt like the looks were good. It was just weird seeing them not going. Shout out to Jalen for keeping them in the game. And I'm very proud of how they battled back. They cut the lead down in almost no time. It felt very quick from them being down 15 to them being tied before the break. And not only did they catch up, tie the game, they went through, they finished the game, and they did it relatively comfortably. That lead got up to 10 points in the fourth quarter. The Celtics played patient ball. They played defense. They did all of the things they needed to do to win. They controlled the controllables. And I think that's why it felt so stable. Because I agree. I had the same feeling as RJ. Like, when they were down, I was like, ah, uh, like, this is shitty. Like, it feels bad. But, like, I don't feel like the team is playing bad. I don't feel like they are uh, deservedly down 15 points. It just felt like, wow, like, this is a weird, like, it's not going their way right now. Yeah, I agree. I, I thought it was good. and It was fun to see them. Sort of just battle their way back by playing the same way, but also make adjustments. Like we said on the on the talk and sees with Bobby, <clears throat> they stuck to their guns on def on offense, but switched it up on defense because that's exactly what they needed to do. <clears throat> Next one, Mark Marcus Smat from Prod Asher. Uh, Asher says, on a scale of one to ten, how much do you miss Marcus, and do you often think of him watching games? I asked because I expected to think of what it'd be like if he were still here playing with the C's a lot, but instead, I really don't. Maybe part of that has to do with him and Drew similar games, but I do miss Smart when I think of him. I miss him. I miss the the highlight reel plays. I miss the energy. I, I think the reason I don't necessarily think of it as much is one, Drew Holiday, obviously the impact there and and Derek White, you don't really necessarily have a hole in the backcourt, but also you see the vision because Porzingis has been exactly what this team needs. And, and as much as it sucks that he was the, the, the hill that the Celtics or not the hill, but like he was the, the piece that had to fall to get Porzingis, like the impact of Porzingis is like undeniable like there there is no yeah. shying away from the fact that it was the correct trade it just sucks so i think that helps mentally process it so i don't know how much i think of marcus when i watch the celtics i think because the team's winning it causes us not to really think about that we're pretty happy with the product we see on the court we're not comparing we're not like oh wow like if they had marcus maybe they win that one they're winning games that thought's not happening the thing that sucks about this whole thing is when you hear about how poorly the Grizzlies are playing. Or you see Young and his teammates. Or you see him, you know, just clearly unhappy and not having as much fun as he would be having here. Because Marcus was, by all accounts, a pretty good guy. Like, cared about the community. Liked being here. Amazing. And it really felt like he deserved to be a part of whatever they were building. It sucks that they let him go. Uh, I still have the good fellas. Tommy gets uh, made slash whacked with the Marcus Photoshop on it as my cover photo. I just, I don't know. I, I think this is a good email though, because I probably don't think of him during games as much as I had thought. And I think that has to do with Porzingis too. Porzingis rules. He's probably my new favorite player. 
I just think he always plays under control. There's not a lot of times where I watch Porzingis. I'm like, damn, like he shouldn't have done that thing. Like even, even on Tuesday, over six in the first half, two points. Follows it up with a 19 point second half masterpiece. He looked great. He scored a bunch of points in a row for the Celtics. And again, he just remained steady, continued to be under control. He really thrives with the defensive focus, not necessarily having to be on him all the time. The yeah. thing that sucked about that trade was that it wasn't initially supposed to be smart, which is why. Yeah, that's what made it hurt. I, do you think it would have hurt less if it wasn't always smart? I think so. What do you mean? Like if it was never, oh, it was going to be Brogdon, but now it's smart. Like if it was, it was always just, yeah, it's got to be more uh, smart. I think at the time it would have still sucked, but. Uh, In hindsight, maybe. It would have wore off a lot faster. I, To be honest, I'm almost happy it worked out the way it did. Because then they easily flipped Malcolm Brogdon into Drew Holiday. Like, do you think they would have traded Smart for Drew Holiday? Yeah, I do. I do. It would have been a tough think, trade, and it would have been a yeah. tough sell because I think people would have been like, "Well, you have basically the same player, and you don't want to give up Rob or draft picks, and all those points are valid." But I suppose things like that happen for a reason. I'm still looking forward to See, February 4th where he comes back to the guard and he gets a nice mm-hmm. I think he deserves it. Not to get too like deep in the weeds talking about this, but like I almost think they wouldn't have gotten the trade done, not because they wouldn't have been willing to include market because the Marcus, excuse me, but because they might not have been willing to include Marcus and two picks. And at that point, I think another team could have swooped in and beaten the offer. But since it was sure. Brogdon, he was already upset. Regardless, <clears throat> anyways, not I, to, again, I think not the fact to that it would have been a tougher sell would have been, well, tough. I mean, Brogdon yeah. was basically out the door. It was a storyline throughout the summer. It was like, oh, this guy's pissed that they traded him. Everyone understands that. So, yeah, like you have mm-hmm. to move on from him. This is the perfect opportunity. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next one from RJ. Holiday shopping for friends of the green. Happy almost midwinter, guys. It's a bit of a slow day. So how about some holiday cheer with a gift list for the HBTC and the Celtics to Coach Missoula? One of those word a day calendars. He's locked in on curveball and mindset. Time to expand the vocabulary. <laughs> All right. This is going to be fun. I'm excited. <clears throat> All right. To Chris Stapps Porzingis. For the happiest man in the Commonwealth, an endorsement contract with a Boston dental clinic where he can show off his smile and get paid for it. That's pretty good. <laughs> to Derek White, computer, a TV, and a smartphone that all automatically mute ESPN unless it's saying he is one of the top players in the league. <clears throat> Agree. To the new Bus One Boys, autographed copies of Luke Cornett's Guide to Success. <laughs> to Luke Cornett, a book contract to write Luke Cornett's Guide to Success. <laughs> to Is Sam, he's going to do something with his free time. <clears throat> to Sam, the gift of better Wi-Fi without it being a Vegas hotel bathroom. <laughs> uh, to Jack, yeah. sinuses that give you less grief. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, to all of the HBTC crowd, many more years of outstanding content from our two favorite morons. Or are you idiots this week? It's hard to keep up. We're always both. Uh, it's it's always both. Thank I will you. say this, knock on wood, but the Wi-Fi has been very good since I returned home. So you can't say that. You just you can't say that. It, oh. it has. It's been pretty good. <sighs> Shit. Yeah. It well, has. It know. has like stretches where it's good, and then it just shits the bed. It's it's gone for a week or two weeks. <laughs> All right, well, well, then when there's a cut in the pod later, you guys will know why. <clears throat> Last email from Philip. Uh, the the subject is just Joe. <clears throat> Fellas, I know you're kicking ass. Hopefully the C's are too as we approach the back-to-back. I really Getting think the narrative... Be honest with you. <laughs> I really think the narrative of Joe as, quote, he is new, so of course he will suck, has to go. Ratless the haters. He got pinned by the smooth brains as an offensively crazed, defensively ignorant coach last season, especially because Ime was praised for his defensive acumen. Um, we made the offseason trades. Everyone proclaimed that we were going to take steps backward defensively, even if, quote, Joe's offense works. Uh, but that's not how it's gone. Joe said he would emphasize defense and, and it would show. It did. He has schemes. Last year's team just had less options. Other than the sad Neanderthal perspective that common fans understand timeouts better than Joe. <laughs> why does this guy get so much hate? Can we anti ratless Joe? He's competitive as fuck, understands the technical side of the ball, and is growing as a leader. If I had a mic, I'd throw it down, Phil. Joe's been great this year. Like, like I've seen it on Twitter a lot. I've thought it. I know we've talked about it. Like That Cavs game showed not only can he make adjustments, not only is he willing to timeouts, call timeouts, and that timeouts don't fucking matter half the time because he called timeouts in the first quarter and it didn't work. But he is like so 
open and ex- and he explains stuff well to the media. He's very comfortable. I feel like now he does have schemes. He does has have different things he likes to do defensively. He likes to put Chris stops in the drop. Then he likes to have him press up and he changed that mid game when it mattered against the Cavs. He has an offensive philosophy that he sticks to because it works, but he's also willing to go to the post. Like, you're really starting to see who Joe is as a coach because I truly think that he used the offseason to formulate that because he didn't have a chance to last year. He talked about it in the JJ Redick pod to start the year. He was thrown into the deep end. He said, yeah, I was just depending on the players for most of the time because one, I didn't know what I was doing a lot because I was fucking thrown into a job I didn't expect to have. And two, I was learning on the fly with a full year under his belt. You're starting to see him be able to implement some of his coaching philosophies. I agree with everything you said, Philip. I think Joe deserves uh, you know, a ton of love for what he's done this season rather than the hate that he gets always. Uh, and again, as Sam always says and will say, blaming the coach is fucking lame. Why'd you have to say it? Because I, because I knew that's you were like say all it. I had to add. I, I'm fighting <laughs> for my life over here. I mean, I, knew, I agree. I, knew I like it. Joe. I, I think he's funny. I don't love the threes all the time, but I get it. And again, I, I truly do think like, if you really want to blame him, like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, maybe blame Tatum for taking step back threes and throwing them off the backboard. Or blame Brown for drilling out of bounds. Or, I don't know, blame Porzingis for not always being, like, super strong. Or blame, I don't know, take your pick. Blame Al for being old. I don't know. I, I don't want to be a dick to these guys. I like them all too much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think Joe's been great. I think we share the sentiment that you shouldn't blame him. Uh, and I agree. Thank it's you lame. That. Don't anyway. blame the coach. Always lame. All right. Unless the coach Let's... is Monty Williams because he's getting paid too much money. And then uh, <laughs> they're not winning a whole lot. And it sounds hey. like he's not doing anything like to change his ways. So there are tough. exceptions to every rule. Uh, let's jump into the NBA part of the show. <clears throat> check in around the league to our daily or podly is the term that I've coined. Standings check in. Uh, Sam, it's time for our favorite segment. Have the Pistons won a game? They've not. They've not <laughs> no. Won. They have not. <laughs> they have now lost 20 games in a row. Sam, I believe, had them as the 10th seed in the East this year heading into the season. Yeah, there's still time. There's still time. There's teams that are going to make trades. The Pistons have communicated <laughs> that they're trying to win. The sad part is they're not doing a very good job. The Pistons it, are... But they are inex- trying. They are inexplicably... <laughs> I'm doing math. Eight and a half games back... Or no, seven and a half games back at the 10 seed, 24 games into the season. That's that's so impressive. And they are 10 and a half games back at the nine seed. I mean, wow. Like that is next level. The Spurs as well. was 11th in fairness to me. Mm. Not 10. My bad. You're right. My bad. They're also, for what it's worth, seven games out of 11th. Um, a but lot of games. very interesting look in the East. It is very clear who the good and the bad teams are. Look at this. Top seven teams all on win streaks. Bottom eight teams all on losing streaks. Now, some are one or two, but like it is just very rare you see it that evenly divided. Uh, And the top eight, for what it's worth, have sort of separated themselves. Or the top nine, I should say. Uh, Cavs and the Nets are nine and eight. um, Or excuse me, eight seed Nets, nine seed Cavs. And then the Hawks are 10, but the Hawks are three games behind both of them. Cavs and Nets are both a couple games above 500. Hawks are four games below. So you're sort of seeing that divide start to take place. I do think the Hawks are probably better than all the teams below them, uh, but they have struggled lately. They're three set, three and seven, I should say, uh, in their last 10. So you're starting to see the I think they're going to really get their lick back tonight. They get the, they get the Raptors. Oh, well, you, that's a battle for the mid. It's the, the battle you, of mid. You guys, you guys tell me these were my picks today. Did not bet, but my buddy was like, make a parlay. I was like, okay. Mm. Picked uh, Pelicans minus seven and a half. Against, against Washington. Two. Okay, yep. Atlanta money line. Hornets mm-hmm. plus eight against Miami. Uh, Indiana minus six and a half. And I think that was it. Who's okay. Indiana playing? Milwaukee. They're no, minus I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Milwaukee minus six and a half. Oh, oh, okay. Um, Milwaukee right now losing. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I don't know, but I think the Pacers have been hot, and they have played the Bucks pretty well this season. Yeah, um, but the and Bucks then, are home, and they have a chip on their shoulder after they got beat in Vegas. And they I have suppose. Thanasis. It's true. You, I did forget about that. That's my bad. Um, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know about the Hornets either. The Hornets are – they weird me out, man. I don't know what to think. Hornets lost by two on Monday to the Heat. To who? Okay. Well, then, sure, I'll back it. <clears throat> Looking out west – 
Timberwolves, Thunder, Mavs, Nuggets still top four uh, in the West. Kings still hanging on to a top five seed. Lakers as well up there. Clippers and Suns starting to figure it out. Clippers have won five games in a row now. Suns are six and four in the last ten, as are the Pelicans, who are slowly turning around. Warriors continue to suck. We'll get to the Draymond thing later because, <laughs> yikes. Uh, and the Rockets have now won three in a row once again, sort of getting back above 500. It does feel like it's going to be a race for the 10 seed between the Pe the Warriors, Pelicans, and Rockets. Uh, the Jazz, Grizzlies, Blazers, and Spurs do seem kind of out of it right now, although the Grizzlies are a bit of a wild card because you don't really know what's going to happen when John Moran comes back. But they have lost uh, seven of their last 10, so it's not looking good for them either. Any thoughts out West? Any thoughts? Any input? Anything to add? Spurs really going to have a pissing contest <laughs> with the Pistons, huh? <laughs> They have won a combined five games. <laughs> also, job back in three games. Tank is True. off. True. For what it's worth, the Grizzlies are only six games out of the, uh, what's it called? I probably shouldn't be saying only because there's only yeah. 20 teams. Uh, however, I don't know. I, I can't really count them out with teams like the Rockets and the Pelicans because those two teams seem so volatile in terms of what they do on and off the court with injuries and in the fact that the Rockets are newly a good team. So I'm not going to count them out of a play in spot, but it just seems very unlikely that the Grizzlies get in at this point. Also, fuck the Suns because they <laughs> big circle jerk today because uh, all three of their guys are finally going to play. It's only <laughs> December. Yeah. Hey, they got it together eventually. They got oh, it there. One big three going to make its debut. It's not a big three. Fuck off. They can't all play together because they can't stay healthy. Oh, did that piss me off today? Beals had a uh, back spasm. I'm sorry to the guy that has back spasms in the chat, but he's had back spasms for uh, ever. Hmm. Get on the court. If we're going to have a big off season bonfire because you're going to get traded, you, you got to play. You got to play. Sure. All right, next thing is the Wizards who are moving to Virginia. Now, contrary to popular belief, they're not moving to the middle of the state of Virginia. <clears throat> they are just moving across the river. Yeah, they're what fucking idiot than... would think that? <laughs> they're moving like less than a mile, I believe, away from their home arena, just moving just, into Alexandria. I, mixed um, up. I kind of thought Virginia was a little <laughs> higher up on the on the coast. <laughs> it was like Northern Virginia. Damn, they're like they're kind of moving far away. No, they border uh, each other. They, they are not. They're They're not moving that far away. They uh, border each other, and it is a $2 billion plan to bring the Wizards to Virginia for what it's worth. Um, let me quickly pull up the screen here for YouTube viewers. This is what it's going to look like out there. Um, <clears throat> future development, Virginia Tech here, blah, blah, blah. Uh, these are some renderings of the monumental sports entertainment districts for the Potomac Yard. So like a very, like a, this is a big plan. This isn't just the Wizards getting a new arena. This is a giant complex of buildings and stuff um, that will be put into place with a big courtyard for fans, a lot of shops, entertainment, Virginia Tech's there. Um, <clears throat> On the river, giant complex, as you can see here on the screen. The Capitals and the Wizards uh, are planning to move here. I think this is the airport in the background as well. So this is a huge plan for the Wizards to move. I, uh, I ran um, over there. Yeah. I was there. <clears throat> oh, that's cool. Nice. But yeah, Wizards moving. $2 billion plan. Not much other than that to note. But Tell you what, you get the Wizards. Good for them. Good for them. <laughs> Big win. Good for them. You can watch <laughs> Jordan them. Poole. Imagine they reject the plan. Like, hey, trade this dude or not. They're like, listen, like, we're not going to break ground until that guy's gone. <laughs> if I'm the Wizards, I'd be like, all right. <laughs> they just wave him. Just can't get him out. Jordan Poole, uh, the only guy Draymond was right to punch in the face? Up there. Up there. He's definitely on the list. Um,. <laughs> I just I just looked up Jordan Poole and the first headline I saw was the Wizards can't even tank properly. Uh, just tough. Um, next thing we got is ejections are getting. God damn it! I gave you a segue for Draymond. <laughs> I'm not looking up there. I'm looking at the timestamps, buddy. Oh, I said, I said, I said he's the only one. <laughs> We're gonna try this again. He's the the only one Draymond was right to punch in the face. Oh, yeah. By fine. the way, Draymond Dex Nurkic, and now he's fine. suspended indefinitely. Fine. We'll talk about Draymond <laughs> I'll next. I'll just, I'll just ignore the fucking timestamps that I had set up that I'm trying I'm to do sorry, I'm to sorry. fucking fix your timestamps. Uh, Draymond Green. I, I forget the... that you do the timestamps to be. I'm sorry. <laughs> Draymond Green punched the fuck. I was just, I was just really dish. proud of that. And I was like, I really, I really would like that to just be a seamless transition. <laughs> My bad. 
Uh, Draymond has been suspended indefinitely <laughs> for <laughs> punching Juice, uh, Yusuf Nurkic in the face. Um, per Adrian Wojnarowski, uh, Chris Haynes also noted that he will be allowed to practice with the team while serving his, his suspension. It is good, except when you remember the fact that he's literally punched teammates in practice too. No so one's like you, you have to respect it. Like at least he's being fair. <laughs> Um, Except like everyone but Jordan Poole has been a European guy, like Gobert. Yeah, Nurkic. I forget who pointed that out. Who you was see it? Gilbert was Arenas? It, uh... Was it Gilbert Arenas? Gil- well, I don't Gilbert know Arenas. No, no, no. It was it... Nick Young who pointed out. He's, sure. like, he's only like but... fighting European guys. Do you hear what Gilbert Arenas said about that? <laughs> Watch out, Kristaps. By the way, no, he said good. Put them in their place <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> what the fuck? What are we doing? <laughs> Um, but Sham is uh, like build the wall. Draymond punches. Sham Sharania also reporting. Draymond is expected to receive counseling and work with the Warriors and NBA <laughs> while suspended. Uh, expected to have to meet criteria before returning. Woj stating that Green uh, or Draymond, Mike Dunleavy, the Warriors GM, uh, and Green's agent Rich Paul are expected to meet Thursday to start discussing a path of counseling and help for Green to move forward. The league didn't want to put a specific number on the suspension, but. Uh, allow Green to take the time you might need to deal with the challenges he's facing. Um, for those who are haven't been on the internet <clears throat> for 24 hours, uh, let me pull up the video of him just <laughs> punching the shit out of Yusuf Nurkic. I'll say this um, about Draymond: is he does always find a unique way to do it. He does. He, he does. The stomp uh, is still a match. That was the greatest moment I've ever seen in a basketball game. Stomp was by far the best uh, method of method of beat down <laughs> Draymond assault. Green. Yeah, uh, yeah. There, Draymond's best assault ever. Here's Draymond just <laughs> clocking this shit. <laughs> I mean this shit's this crazy. In the background. No 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 oh, oh. Uh, it's going. Don't look, worry. Look, we'll look, see look, it look, again. Look, look. Oh he's shocked. <laughs> I mean he he got him good. He he clocked the shit. Like, the Warriors bench why? didn't see it. Why do you why why do this? <laughs> Why do this? Like, I don't get it. What What are you benefiting from this? No one's like, wow, Draymond's super tough. He hit this guy when he wasn't <laughs> like a, ready. Look at Trace Jackson Davis, the Warriors rookie. Look at him. He's like, ah, shit. <laughs> look at him. He's like, what What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know what he's thinking? He's like, more playing time for me. I'm about to he's play like, some yes. more minutes. <laughs> for Good what it's worth. The though. They play Golden State next week. So yep, that's not one less game that Chris Stops has the opportunity to be punched in the face by Draymond. He, I'm not going to be there. Draymond did talk about it after the game, uh, and it was it was did real he funny. Sorry? He said, well, he said I, uh, Nurkic was pulling my hip, and I was swinging away to sell the call, and I made contact with him. <laughs> As you know, I'm not one to apologize for things that I meant to do, but I do apologize to Yusuf. I didn't intend to hit him. He's like, sometimes I mean it, but this time I didn't. Like, brother, Good. that's Fine not for the... flopping too. Like, just give him like an extra fun because he's like basically like, yeah, I did flop. He did admit to flopping. Um, he's like in court trying to like plead, like, okay, yeah, I killed the guy, but I actually was trying to like just assault him. I mean, I did say sorry. <laughs> yeah, like, can you just give me manslaughter instead? Man, uh, this this shit's ridiculous. It's. I, I don't get it. It's one of the most uh, worthy ejections of the season, right? Speaking of ejections, let's. Talk- there you go. <laughs> We're back. Well, I'm well, now. I can follow the sheet. Yes. Uh, ejections are getting fucking crazy this season. Nikola Jokic was ejected last night as we're recording this. Let me pull up the clip. Uh, and Sam, you tell me if you can see okay. what warranted an ejection. My uh, brothers will fucking tear you limb from limb. This was Mark Lindsay. For what it's worth, this is the same ref who ejected Jalen. Uh, this is the pool report. Question. What did Nikola Jokic do or say to warrant the first technical foul? Lindsay. To be clear, Jokic was ejected after one technical foul because he directed profane language at the official that, by our standards, warranted an ejection. Is that typical for an ejection to follow one technical foul? To be clear, Jokic was ejected after one technical foul. Yeah, you're on the same page at that point. Question. Did he receive Did he receive a, a warning between the first technical foul and the ejection? Lindsay, again, to be clear, Jokic was ejected after one technical foul. <laughs> Question. Obviously, the language was so strongly received that it warranted an ejection in your guys' eyes. Lindsay, we don't typically publicly get into exactly what a player said, but the language reached the standard for an ejection. This is fucking ridiculous. The refs need to be stopped. They, it, like, And I'm not, you well, know, know what it is. I, I'm not one to, to, to blame the refs. It's fucking absurd this year. It is un- unacceptable. 
It's because they really want to see like guys fall and snap their necks on these dunks. So they're getting impatient. So they're having well, short fuses with the rest of the guys, and then they're banging guys with text if they don't try and fall and break their neck. Did you see the Tim Hardaway one, I assume? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking <laughs> Let me pull it up. Uh, exactly. So here, here is Tim Hardaway getting a technical foul for hanging on the rim. Let's see what happens here. Hmm. Let me dunk here. Oh, I felt contact beneath me. Let, let me go. be careful and look down. No, no, let go and break your neck. <laughs> yeah, when do you want him to let go? <laughs> How is that a tech? In, in what world is that a technical In a foul? world where the Lakers are down 16 points. that That's My also God. part of it. It's Shout out crazy. to the Mavs, though. They beat the Lakers. So good for them. <clears throat> it's crazy. Jamal Murray. <laughs> Jamal Murray also recently got a technical foul. Let's take a look to see what he did. Let's see. Jamal Murray. Uh, <sighs> at least Come this on. is like on par. Because for years, the NBA has been like, hey, don't like taunt guys. Now, do I think it's soft? Yes. This is literally in the playoffs last year. This mm-hmm. this is soft, yes, but it is on brand. It, it's like <laughs> everyone kind of knows like that's the rule. Yeah, my bad. That's not what I wanted to define. Jamal Murray got ejected recently this year. I wanted to find that clip because I also heard that was kind of uh, ridiculous. Um, uh, he <laughs> found it. So he did a, you hit him below the belt. No, no, no. <laughs> so we can, here's the, is it conclusive this or not? This, he, he ba- this wasn't this year? You see the, uh, mask, see the background. I, I'm brother? getting fucking. I, I'm getting <laughs> annoyed because Jamal Murray got ejected recently. It was in. Uh, I remember we talked about it. Um, uh, I can't find the clip at the moment because I'm getting scammed. But I, JB and JT also have gotten ejected this year. Yeah. Neither of those was fair. They have talked about it. It just seems like refs are on a power trip this year. I don't get it. They sure <laughs> are. I don't get it. Hmm. Not enough necks being broken. That's why it's a mess. It's a mess. Um, just give them one. Th- yeah, that's Draymond's that's punishment. Is he has to do a dunk, but he can't hold the rim. <laughs> yeah, no more holding the ring for Draymond. He has to be the sacrificial lamb that he can play again. That's mm. that's the indefinite. All right, last bit of NBA news here is Taj Gibson has signed with the Knicks because when all Sick. else fails for New York, get Taj, get that man with Tom Thibodeau Knicks back. How many stints is this for him? I, this is like completely irrelevant news to the grand scheme of things, but it's just funny. Taj Gibson, Tom Thibodeau, handshake. Question. Over under 10 minutes a night. Under. Extra context. Mitchell Robinson out six to eight weeks. Probably still under. Really? Interesting. Um, I don't know, man. I, I feel like Taj, or excuse me, uh, excuse me, eight to 10 weeks for Mitchell Robinson. Um, angle surgery. I feel like uh, Tom Thibodeau could pull a, you know what, Jericho Sims? Sorry, brother, it's Taj Gibson time. We're putting this man in the game. Um, I don't know. I just thought it was funny. We don't actually have to talk about it. I'll be there no matter what. Taj <laughs> Gibson signing with the Knicks. Handshake. Uh, all right, let's get into the Rattlers here. Would you like to kick it off, sir? Yeah, Rattlers my nose. And also Rattlers blowing my nose so much that I have the fucking rot, like dry skin. It- yep. Yep, yep. Like, like I was playing basketball and I was sweating and like the the sides of my nose were burning. I was like, what is going on here? Fuck Vegas. They took my money, they took my voice. Then I come back here and my body is not prepared for the weather. Yeah. And now you have to listen to me talk like this. It's exhausting. Well, they already have to listen to me talk like that, so it's okay. They're used yeah, to they don't need both of us. <laughs> They're used to it. They'll live. Um, Ratless my aunt's dog, who is still an asshole. Uh, I cannot express to you how much I hate this dog. Um, I don't, I'm not going to say that. Uh, I, he, he's an asshole. He's the worst. He is, you know, go to let him out of the cage. He's clawing at the locks and he claws the fuck out of your hands. You go to open the door. He's trying to claw at that, clawing the fuck out of your hands. Doesn't wait to get food. Tries to put his head in the bucket. You have to close it on him and push him out of the way. He, he's drinking at your feet. He'll drool all over you. He's, he is the worst. He is truly the worst. Not a fan. Uh, his name's Rocket. He's an asshole. Cannot stand him. Uh, Ratlist Rocket. Dick. <laughs> okay. Fuck him. Fuck him. Rocket, That's another word for dick. It's true. What you got? That's That was my first. Ratlist... 
the Rhode Island Department of Transportation. We are <laughs> fucking back. So I assumed, I assumed you were gonna lead with this. <laughs> so if you're not from the region, you may not know. Heading into Providence, there is 95, there is Route 6, there's Route 146, and then there's Route 195. Route 195 goes out east into southern Massachusetts. The likes of Fall River, New Bedford, shout out. Uh, And you go Mm. towards Cape Cod, pretty much, right? It also goes to the half of Rhode Island that's separated by an entire body of water. There's the East Bay, which is that side, and then the West Bay, where I'm from. There are people who live on the East Bay, but they work the West Bay. So they have to take 195 or they have to go all the way to Newport and take that bridge, which has been a shit show to my understanding. But the Rhode Island Department of Transportation was like, hey, look, no more 195. <laughs> we have to close it. Found a deficiency in the bridge. So people are losing their minds. Mm. You go to the Rhode Island subreddit. They are none too pleased. Yeah. There was a screenshot of, so if if you go to the <laughs> Department of Transportation website, yeah, you could 24 yeah, hours I, a day look at their traffic cameras. I can help you out. I think I already found it. Is this it? You looked? I've got it on the screen. Uh, tell, me, tell me what to click. <laughs> uh, well, the Washington Bridge is what's closed. Right now, it's not very busy. I'm not convinced this is real, by the way. Sure. Because it is late, but like I was looking in the middle of the day and I was like, there's nobody like backed up on the highway, but it's 6 a.m. There was bumper to bumper traffic. By the way, this does not affect me. Mm. There was bumper to bumper traffic at 6 a.m. It's taking people two and a half hours to get to work from Seacon, which is not very far from Providence. Mm. That's ass. And I am never, ever, ever going to pass an opportunity to rip the Department of Transportation. The absolute (laughs) dumpster fire, shit show, disgrace, uh, terrorist organization that it is. Because they just, I swear to God, these people just make work for themselves so they stay employed. Now, listen, I'm not rooting for a bridge to collapse. That's not what I'm saying. I, this is a situation where I think you do have to like, like, yeah, like what they're doing is necessary, but it's really strange that the alternative is like, hey, drive through downtown Providence with every million, like every traffic light there could possibly be. I was in Providence yesterday and the traffic in residential areas, there's box trucks in residential areas. You were getting stuck at lights for multiple rounds. You know how yeah. painful that is? Is to get stuck. Maybe more painful than collapsing bridge. Being on the collapsing bridge. Power rankings of things I would like to happen to me in a car. Could be on a collapsing bridge. I would rather have that than being stuck in a light for three times. <laughs> I don't know about you. Because think of it like this: well. collapsing bridge, probably get some time out of work, <laughs> or you die. <laughs> Or you fucking cease to exist. Yeah, but you die like a hero. Everyone's like, oh, poor guy. You don't like die you a fucking hero. Well, I, yeah, you do. Because if you die, guess who didn't die? A whole bunch of other people because they knew the bridge collapsed. <laughs> you mean the intelligent people who knew not to go on the bridge? No, but that's the thing. Like, if the bridge collapses and, like, nobody knew about it, like, guess who found out first? Me. <laughs> I found out first. <laughs> and you're fucking dead. <laughs> oh, man. Um, Ratless Duncan. It's a very simple rat list. If I ask for milk and you give me cream, you're a moron. That's it. That's the whole rat list. I just not a fan uh, of it. Like, like you can't listen. I see it. I see you said milk and you put it typed in as milk on the screen. Then what, what disconnects from you from the time you punch it into the computer to the time you walk over to put the milk into the coffee where you're like, nah, I'm going to put cream in it. Like again, I wouldn't want to work very hard if I worked at a fast food restaurant either. 
but this isn't not working hard. You're doing the same level of work. You're just forgetting from the fucking two minute span from here to there. And it, <laughs> this isn't like a one time thing. This is every time. Like, what what are we doing here? Like, uh, it, it frustrates me because you can tell. But whatever. Piss. Uh, rat list. So you you know like when you get on a highway and like there's a disappearing lane, it, it's the hash mm-hmm. marks, right? Yeah. Like it, it eventually runs out. So I'm in one of those sure. lanes. Sure. And I go to merge over, and someone like tries to speed up to like not let me in, and then they get mad. It's like, what did you want me to do? Fucking start flying? Is that what you wanted? Like I had to go somewhere. It's not like we're moving. Like it's traffic, bumper to bumper. Shout out to Rydot, the Department of Transportation. That yeah. rat LVD needs. To they be wouldn't killed. let you in. Yeah, that's I the mean, worst. they tried not to. I went in, but they like honked at me. It's like fuck I em. wish I had a tank. I would flip you over. Yeah, fuck them. Yeah, Teach that's you just the worst. That pisses me off. No, the Department uh, of Transportation gonna... was the closer. Mm. Uh, I'm gonna preemptively rat list the chat. Chat, I swear to fucking god. If you don't say a single word about his sniffles on this show, I'm gonna be mad forever because I've gotten it time and time again. Well, it's sad. Chad. Like I'm sick. Like it sucks. Like, oh, oftentimes the so... chat's very nice. No, to no. Like, they're like, "Wow, like that sucks, Sam." Like I hope you feel better. <laughs> and you know, it's that's all that's gonna happen too. That's why I'm putting you on the rat list in advance. All of you, all, every single one of you, rat list. <laughs> all... Embarrassed me. I have been trying to mute as much as I can, but if I'm talking, I have to sniffle. Like I can't. I have to. Sorry. You blame oh, Vegas. They took my money, took my nostrils, took my voice. Uh, all right. Uh, you got anything else you want to wrap there? Uh, I, I think that's it. I, yeah, pretty good day. Pretty good day. I think we are good. Thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate it very much. We will both be at the game tonight as you're listening to this uh, as media for free game. So you'll get that uh, both at the game. Sam can understand the, the struggles of trying to show the fucking blinding light of the court on the laptop. Well, you know, uh, you know, I actually won't. You know why? Because I'm not a fucking moron and I'm not going to try and do it. <laughs> I'm trying to improve the experience. Uh, thank you all for tuning in to Abbott and Celtics. Make sure to subscribe. Check out our newsbreaker video on Drew Peterson. Check out Talk and Seize. Bobby Karitsky both dropped last night as you're listening to this. Uh, make sure to leave a review on Apple. Leave us five stars on Spotify and Apple. And I'll let Sam take it out. Hey, thank you very much for listening or watching. If you're watching, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube page. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss any full-length pods like this. Uh, talk and seize with Bobby. Breaking news videos. Imagine being a sucker and not having the bell on today. You wouldn't miss that, idiot. Uh, then you have our reaction videos. You have our film breakdowns. You have our trade rumor breakdowns, whatever. Uh, you'll get all of it if you hit the bell. If you follow us on Spotify or Apple, all the full-length pods and game recaps will go right to your feed, the audio version. So who doesn't love that? Leave a five-star review. Say something nice about the pod. Make sure you comment what's popping to be entered into the Impop Nito giveaway. You don't want to miss out on it. The product is awesome. We would not promote it if we didn't like it. Uh, you can also reach out to us, HBC hbtcpod at gmail.com with all your emails Di- guys did a great job today tons of emails we love it you can find us on socials at how about them sees that's twitter instagram tiktok facebook it's just the name of the podcast our pregame streams will be there as well as youtube a half hour before every game you can follow jack on twitter at jackson you can follow me at simple friends and me that's it for us Bye. <laughs>